Finance is really the key to wealth. And if I was to sum up the conversation around building wealth, it is really mastering finance. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers. Here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, a code cracker. We're going to dig into finance. Of course, real estate is just a game of properties with finance gluing it all together. Really, the number one way to become wealthy out of real estate is leverage. Most Australians simply don't have enough leverage in their world. They haven't leveraged enough capital into the market to create the wealth effect in their space. So today we're going to go through some common borrowing mistakes and of course dig into how can we increase our serviceability so we can go off and build a little small fortune for ourselves and not end up being little gopniks. So it should be a fun-filled show. Uh, And of course, welcome back, all you urban property investors. I hope your week has been well. My week is great. Everything is uh, honky-dory, as they say. But uh, if it's your first time tuning in, well, welcome aboard. Wow, you've discovered something wonderful. Uh, We do a lot of lessons around real estate on this podcast, and it's just me. Yes, there are no other people who talk on the podcast. So if you like the sound of my voice, if you like the cut of my jib, you've come to the right place. But of course, all the programs I've done or podcasts are actually lessons on real estate. So feel free free to go back and uh, see if there's something that you want to learn about and have a bit of a listen. But today we're going to go through some really finance dialogue because finance is really the key to wealth. And if I was to sum up the conversation around building wealth, it is really mastering finance. And of course, finance is the idea of borrowing money. And when many property investors started out, those with larger portfolios today, they went through periods of time where accessing money was very, very easy. Today, it is a little bit harder, but that's not to say it won't get easier into the future. The property market goes through periods of deleveraging and over-leveraging. And of course, when there's an opportunity to grab money and ultimately the banks are, I guess, shoveling it out, so to speak, it's a great opportunity to build your wealth. And I've certainly built a lot of my wealth off the back of banks basically uh, getting money out of their institutions into the economy. So we're ultimately going to be successful as property investors if we borrow other people's money. And of course, Banks here in Australia are very pro-property. That's their product. They lend money to people. So it's up to us to be very financial and uh, put ourselves in a position where we can connect to that money. But there are some common borrowing mistakes that a lot of people make if they're trying to build a fortune out of real estate. And I want to go over some of the principles behind finance and some of the serviceability cheats that we can use to ultimately get more money into the market. Remember, the biggest challenge for Australians is they don't have enough access to capital, so they can't put enough capital into the market. Capital, of course, are deposits, and deposits allow you to put Uh, some money down on a property, whether it's through cash or equity. But ultimately, we've got to be able to service debt to acquire assets. So it is a bit of an algorithm to build a portfolio, that is for sure. So I think the first mistake that is common is really an emotional attachment to a bank. Uh, You know, here in Australia, 
banks are very, very good at anchoring younger Australians to be part of their uh, world. Uh, we have things like the Dolomite account here in Australia. And of course, um, you know, for a lot of Australians, really, they've got this kind of emotional connection with the bank. Um, and of course, that can hold people back. Uh, listening to only one financial institution's opinion on a property and uh, what they can borrow or lend you is not a wise idea. And thankfully, here in Australia, we have multiple lenders. We have brokers who have a showcase or a suite or a smorgasbord of lenders to use. Of course, lenders allow you to get different rates of servicing and a different mathematical equation to what you can actually go off and buy. You know, by way of example, you could see one bank and they'll lend you $700,000. The very next bank with the same set data set will lend you $800,000. The difference is a really important concept because if you know how to play the real estate game, obviously the $800,000 property may just get you a better location, better street, a better rate of capital growth because of the superior nature of the product based on the price. And I see this a lot in real estate. Uh, you can go up by $100,000 in incremental dollar value for an asset, but really you're almost doubling your capital growth rate because you are entering a product range which is just so superior. Even though it's only $100,000 more, it's almost 100% better as an asset. So as prices go up, so does your opportunity for capital growth. So I'd say the first rule around uh, the idea of borrowing money is don't be so emotionally invested that you've got some sort of, I guess, uh, you know, connection with one of the banks, which has been conditioning us for a very, very long time. It's great to have a bank you prefer, but ultimately if you can borrow more money, get more capital into the market and use a bank which you've never heard of, then uh, take that opportunity because really real estate is a game of leverage. The more leverage you've got out there, the more opportunity you're going to have to be a successful property investor. I guess uh, also what we need to understand is if we assume our assets are income, we can have a bit of a rude shock. And of course, a strong asset position makes an application stronger. We don't want to be uh, a basket case of liabilities. And of course, assets are income producing assets. They may not be considered assets if they detract from our balance sheet. So a car, for example, is not necessarily an asset. It usually has a loan and that loan uh, can affect what we borrow. A credit card, for example, is going to set back our uh, basically balance sheet for better word. So also we can build equity in our properties and sometimes people have a strong equity position but that doesn't actually equate to the ability to go and service more income. It certainly helps but it's not going to mean you're going to build a big uh, portfolio if you can't service. So what a lot of property investors do is they buy a property which is so, so negatively geared that it's costing them tens of thousands of dollars out of their back pocket per annum to, to hold. And what happens is they just simply are buried in a uh, rut of too much income detracting from their servicing and even though they've got equity, they can't use the equity because their servicing is so backwards that they 
can't actually even unlock a new deposit to go again. So it's very important just to have a good balance sheet. Um, Real estate has different growth rates and different rental returns. Now, you don't necessarily want to rush out and buy the highest rental return with the lowest capital growth. That's not a good idea. But there is a bit of a balancing act for a lot of people. And depending on your income, if you can pick up a 3 4 or 5% return, it's just going to mean that you're on paper not going backwards at a massive level when it comes to your cash flow. I guess uh, when it comes to, you know, some of the challenges of borrowing money is your structures. And for a lot of people, there are alternative ways to get capital into the marketplace. And again, you probably need to get some level of advice around structures. Accountants, for example, love selling structures. They are always mad about asset protection and uh, selling you a structure because when they sell you a structure every year, you have to come back and do a tax return and, um, you know, pay for a structure, so to speak. So accountants will always come up with logic that you need to have a property in a different structure. And it's not necessarily, in my opinion, great advice because one of the best things you can do as a property investor in Australia is minimize your personal tax. And for most people, they're not getting sued uh, for owning an investment property uh, in a quiet, quaint suburban street. So unless you have a high-risk job where you could, uh, you know, cause harm to someone else, most people in their line of work do not need sophisticated structures to uh, get started and buy a few properties. So I'm always a believer that with finance, you should exhaust buying in your own personal name before you hop out of your own personal name and buy a structure to uh, basically go and borrow money in. And again, for a lot of uh, people who play the game of real estate and like the game of leverage, you know, that could mean you could get your own uh, family home in your own personal names uh, and one or two or three other investment properties. Then what can ultimately happen is banks start to go, well, there's a lot of debt in your personal name. And of course, uh, that may mean you've run out of the capacity to service. However, you do have alternative ways to get leverage into the marketplace. Uh, an alternative viewpoint is to speak to a financial planner about doing something in your superannuation. Uh, your superannuation is a completely different entity than you as a human being. Uh, and of course, there are some more sophisticated ways to borrow money with LODOC lending, which for a lot of people, they should seek further and better financial advice. But a lot of property investors end up buying other assets by using basically entities, which uh, the banks um, see as a different structure. So, of course... Uh, you should probably go and get some more advice on structures. I'm just going to give you some basic advice, but it's up to you to be very clear on how you're going to play the game of borrowing money, the game of leverage, uh, how much uh, you can put into one structure. And of course, again, like you might have one or two banks help you in your personal name, another bank help you in your superannuation fund, and another bank potentially help you with a company trust structure that you go and set up to build a bigger and better portfolio. But just be very um, mindful that, you know, I often find with accountants that you are the actual product and, um, you know, they'll set up structures to keep you coming back to do tax returns. For the most part, you don't need complicated structures to build a uh, 
get started property portfolio. So just do it in your own name um, and you should be right. So uh, that's the main thing. Now, again, when it comes to, I guess, blunders, when it comes to borrowing, uh, quite often there's an emphasis in Australia on rate. People like low rates. Um, Low rates obviously mean less money coming out of your back pocket ultimately. And of course, rates are part of the game. But again, a lot of borrowers will go and see one bank whose interest rate is, I don't know, 5.74%. And when the calculations are done, they can only borrow $600,000 on the 5.74%. Uh, but they get fixated on the interest rate rather than the leverage. And uh, another bank might charge instead of 5.74%, I don't know, 6%, um, which is a quarter of a percent higher. But instead of lending you $600,000, they will lend you $700,000. And for a lot of property investors, they go, well, look, I can get a better rate um, I can only borrow 600, but I'm going to get a better rate. So I'm going to take the conservative approach and jump on the rate centric offer. But really, the point of property investment is leverage. Uh, it's more capital into the market, more capital, getting a higher rate of capital growth is going to fast track or accelerate your wealth position. Uh, less capital in the market even at a lower cost to buy, is not going to beat more capital in the market, which is bought at a higher cost or interest rate. So it should not be a deciding factor. Rate, interest rate, uh, costs shouldn't be the deciding factor. Obviously, if you put uh, two products next to each other and it's the same amount you can borrow, you know, you would naturally assume to take the lower interest rate. But it's really uh, the amount you can get into the market, which is the most important wealth accelerator that you need to to use. So um, just be mindful of that. The other thing that we need to be mindful is of when it comes to you know borrowing is our credit score. Like we have a credit score now. If you don't have a credit score that you're tracking that is your credit score you should 100% get out there and um, align yourself up with the credit rating agency to monitor your credit score every time you uh, shop these days every time you apply for something every time you um, you know uh, are borrowing money every time you you know put something on lay by in a uh, in a shop, your credit score is being tracked every time you miss a bill that you haven't paid, a utility bill, a um, interest rate payment, everything is tracked. And so today credit scoring is a big part of the puzzle when it comes to borrowing money. And you know what what can happen is you don't know your credit score. And so uh, some funders will penalize certain credit scores. And again, um, you might sort of find yourself in a position where you're having to submit applications to numerous lenders. That starts to trigger alarm bells because your credit score is also often being, um, you know, uh, hit. And of course, particularly those digital you know, clickbait, basically credit, um, you know, websites where it's like, find out how much you can borrow today. Um, You know, you don't know if that is actually going to flag something on your credit rating that you have, uh, you know, looked into your borrowing structure. So you want to be very, very uh, selective about using your credit Um, and how to monitor your credit score. Now, I, um, you know, pay $14.95 
Uh, there it is, $14.95, showing people on YouTube, to uh, Equifax or Equifax, maybe. I don't know. Equifax or Equifax. Wow. What a, uh, what a thing to worry about. Um, so they used to be Vader Advantage, but I pay $14.95 a month and uh, I prefer to pay because credit scores are an important thing. And, uh, you know, today in Australia, you know, so much scamming going on, isn't there? You know, I know about you, but I get a phone call, man, like every day from some scammer, you know, asking me to, um, you know, do something. Now I know who they are. I answered the phone uh, hey, uh, you've called the Australian Federal Police, uh, Sam speaking, like this, and that they, you know, shit themselves, basically. But uh, we're, our numbers are out there, folks. So uh, your email address, your telephone number, man, um, people are getting sadly scammed left, right, and centre. You know, there's some, you know, creeps in downtown Bangalore ringing us up um, you know, trying to pill for our money. And uh, I don't like the sounds of that. So get yourself monitored, pay your $14.95 a month. What you'll end up getting is whenever your credit is hit, like something happens on your name, you will get a little notification. And it can be really like minor stuff. Like I'm connected to a business and, you know, like, you know, like if you got a, a loan on a photocopier, you're like, well, you know, what, why are we getting a loan on a photocopy? It's now connected to my credit rating. I've got a photocopy on my credit rating. Um, I've had people connected to my business get car loans um, and, you know, basically – you know, the business is connected to the car loan, so that's connected to me. So particularly if you're in business, I would absolutely get your credit rating um, monitored, but, you know, individually also. Like there's so many things that will pop up and it allows you to fix things. Like you can always fix your credit score, but if you don't know what you don't know, um, you, you can get yourself into a jam. And I've learned the hard way from that. Um, I actually had a team member, staff member at my work, um, basically forge my signature on a um, on a document, um, which was, I guess, you know, it wasn't intended to be dangerous, um, and they were just like doing something, you know, erratic. Um, they obviously no longer work for me, but, um, you know, they were signing up to a platform um, without my approval and I didn't pay the bill because I said I'd, I've never signed up for this. Um, and, you know, then uh, unbeknownst to me, the cre- the company which, you know, Technically, we had signed up for took uh, took us to to a small claims uh, court for their money, which ultimately uh, I had to go and all sort out. I don't even know I owed the money. I didn't even know I signed up for them. Someone put myself in that position. So this stuff happens is the point. And again, it can really derail your situation that. You know, you you are buying a property, you're expecting to settle it, you've negotiated settlement terms, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, your mortgage broker rings you and goes, mate, do you know you've got a credit default on your file? Like, and you'll be like, well, shouldn't you have picked that up? And they'll go, look, we, we don't look into your credit file. We'll do a credit assessment on what you can borrow it's only picked up at the point where you go to finalize your your loan that you may have a real damage credit rating. So it's up to you. You are in charge of you. And uh, certainly since my bad experiences some 15 years ago of um, signing up to something I didn't sign up to, uh, 
I can assure you I now monitor everything on my credit score. So please take some advice on that and get out there and do it. And uh, I guess as well as a property investor, we need to look over the horizon of where the rate environment is headed. And I think uh, there is always a few people that get nervous about owning real estate and end up, you know, fixing a rate at the peak of the money cycle. Certainly a little tip right now, don't go fixing your interest rates because uh, money seemingly is at the top of the cycle, so the next place is down. And of course, um, you know, there are some smart people who rush to fix money when it was at 1.2%, which was uh, which was a great move. It certainly saved a lot of money. Uh, however, we don't have periods where there is you know, a huge, huge drop in the cash rate to the point where it was at zero uh, basically during COVID. However, um, you know, for a lot of people, just be mindful that interest rate movements are going to fluctuate every, every, uh, you know, month the the Reserve Bank of Australia meets. Um, So the cash rate juggles about, So just be mindful if you're going to fix a loan, you know, you are playing a bit of a game with the economy and the economy moves every single month. Um, I'm not a big fan of fixing and uh, creating sort of break cost problems if you needed to sell. Obviously, if you fix a loan um, and you want to sell, there's going to be some, some cost to breaking that loan. Uh, So you're not liquid. One of the things that I like being in life is liquid, being able to uh, move and, and uh, you know, dance about. But uh, for a lot of people, they've put themselves in a position where they panic at the top of the economic cycle and fix their rate because they assume the top is actually the new bottom and, you know, they don't want to end up in a place where there's some sort of 10% interest rate or cash rate. So uh, the banks love exploiting this fear and they will always promote a fixed rate. There's always a promotion on offer. And again, like you've just, uh, unless you study the bond market, uh, money markets, and, uh, you know, fixed assets, then I would probably just just be variable around what you do. Um, you know, if you've got a good handle on, you know, what's over the horizon, then fair enough. You might be a shrewd player of where money is going to go. And of course, Uh, One of the things you need to also bear in mind when it comes to borrowing money and uh, when it comes to potential mistakes is the idea of cross-securitizing. Cross-securitizing is just the concept that most loan contracts have an all-monies clause in them. Um, And what it allows is for banks to consolidate their position. And so what happens is if you go to the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, you borrow five uh, off them uh, for three properties, um, what will happen is you are basically crossed on all of them. And so let's say um, all your debt is basically morphed together. Let's say you, I don't know, have a property which is not such a performer. It actually goes down in value um, and, you know, you're connected to two properties which have gone up in value. Let's say the two properties that have gone up in value, you know, you've got $400,000 in equity that you would love to use and you've got one property which has gone down by $400,000, well, actually, you've got no equity because the uh, all monies clause kicks in and it means that you're basically neutralized from any uh, of your gains. The alternative is, let's say you had, you know, three loans with three different banks and uh, you've got that two of your properties have got a $400,000 gain, 
the two banks and one's got that $400,000 loss with the third bank, um, you could still technically, if you can service, take equity from the properties which have performed nicely and go and buy a fourth property. Um, so cross-securitization is this kind of concept that you've just got to be mindful of your equity position. You know, uh, it's really only useful um, really as a consolidation tool. So what could happen is you could exhaust your position buying real estate, acquiring real estate. Let's say you're, you're now re- know your number uh, and uh, your number could be, you know, you want $200,000 passive income from real estate. You've acquired basically, you know, $4 million worth of real estate investments. You're now are just going to sit on them for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You're not going to buy any more properties. Um, then uh, what can be useful is to go to one bank and go, well, I want a really low rate because I'm not buying any more properties and I've got a lot of equity. Even if one property went down, my equity position is so strong that, um, uh, you know, I'm all good. What you don't want to do is cross-securitize your family home with your property investments. Uh, It's not a good idea. Again, like the sheer nature of investment carries with it speculation and volatility Uh, Your family home is a roof over your head and uh, for a lot of people, they tie up their home with their investments. And again, like I sort of alluded to, it can mean that you uh, get yourself into a binded pickle and even selling a property, you know, the bank has the all monies clause. So let's say you've got four properties all tangled together the bank um, can come on the day of settlement and grab their money <clears throat> and offset uh, any any sale that you have basically uh, done. Let's say you're selling a property and you know you're like, "Wow, I'm going to sell this one. I need. I'm going to put two hundred thousand uh, dollars in my hot little hand because, after all costs, that's my gain." And the bank then goes, "You know what?" Uh, by that person extracting that $200,000, that's going to change our LVR position in the balance of the portfolio. In other words, uh, it may take your debt to 100% with the bank, but if the $200,000 was back in the bank's hand, it would lower your debt position to 80%. The bank's going to take the money. And uh, this is something that you need to be mindful of if you're going to give control to one lender, they really do have control over your situation. So in general, it's probably a better a, a, a playbook to just have multiple lenders, particularly when you're acquiring assets and uh, you're not going into a consolidation phase. Consolidating is perfectly fine when you're done being a property investor and you're just, uh, you know, doing the hold, but not the buy. It's very, very dangerous in my viewpoint to be too cross-securitized, that is for sure. So how can we go and increase our serviceability? Well, these are great questions. And uh, I think the first one you need to understand is you do quite often carry other debts beyond real estate. Personal loans, credit cards, short-term loans, um, you know, personal loans. These are something which is going to rip your uh, serviceability apart. And again, like just having these things can absolutely impact you on getting more ability to borrow money. So make sure you have a good chat with a broker if you are going to work out how to increase your serviceability range. And maybe just from a short-term perspective, ripping up all your other loans, like get rid of the car, get rid of the credit card, get rid of all of that. And um, you'll put yourselves in a position where some sort of consolidated approach of these debts actually improves your serviceability range. 
Uh, obviously, some people use credit cards for day-to-day life, which I get. I use one. Um, but certainly a lot of people have way more credit cards than they need. And, you know, for a lot of people, it's like, you know, some way to extract frequent flyer points by applying for these credit cards, getting 100,000 Qantas points um, and uh, never even really using the card that often. So I get it, but if you're going to wheel and deal, maybe, you know, six months before you go off and buy a property, reduce your excess credit. It's really, really important to this puzzle. Um, that is for sure. I think from a serviceability point as well, like you want to be very, very financial, very financial. Um, it's in, virtually impossible these days to borrow money if you haven't done tax returns. You're going to get, uh, you could get money without a tax return, but you're going to pay an absorbent rate of interest to borrow the money to put capital into the marketplace. So be financial, you know, make sure if you're, for example, um, you know, a commit commission based employer, you're getting your commissions on time. If you're, uh, you know, um, you're, you know, a PAYG earner, you're, you're keeping your records, you know, where things are, you're doing your tax returns on time. Um, concentrate on the big picture here. Don't slacken off when it comes to, to what you do. And I see this a lot with, um, I guess tradies, um, you know, I often have tradies, you know, do things around my properties and they're always like, you know, do you want to pay some cash? Uh, the old cashy, which is getting harder, let's face it, because, uh, we are in a world of, you know, tap and go, but um, I always feel sorry for buskers. Uh, you know, you listen to their beautiful music and you don't have any coins in your pocket or even notes in your wallet to uh, to put into their to their bin. Uh, I think they need to invent, someone listening uh, who's smarter than I needs to invent a tap and go for the, uh, the music community. But uh, – yeah, you know, obviously you got to get those tax returns done. And, you know, the cashy is just, again, it's not playing big picture economics. It's playing really little picture economics. You know, for the tax that you don't pay by being the cashy guy, um, the amount of serviceability, the amount of money you can make from actually declaring that income um, when it comes to borrowing money is you know, chalk and cheese. And uh, I do see that, and I don't mean to, you know, pick on one section or industry, but I do see this in a lot of the sort of uh, building industry, um, that cashy is is still something everyone loves. Um, and, uh, you know, I've even got sort of a tenant that of mine who's a really, really awesome tenant. He's a tradie, quintessential character um he even does i even throw him some work you know on properties um that uh you know i own and uh you know he, you know he could he makes so much money but he still rents uh and has no investments because he's fixated on this concept of cash and i'm like dude like if you just declared all this income for two years like you could buy a brilliant home for yourself give yourself certainty of tenure for your life and you probably even grab some investments just give up on the cashy because it's it's holding you back from the big picture so just something to flag there that is for sure um obviously when it comes to improving your serviceability loan products play a part and um you know again like there are just so many different loans out there that certain products feature certain things, interest only, fixed rates, variable rates, discount rates, um, overdrafts, all, all sorts of things. So when it comes to serviceability, what is the benefit of a broker? 
Well, if you sit down with your broker and you said to your broker, look, my goal is to borrow eventually to buy three properties. They would approach broking for you different to if you were buying one property. They would actually realize that uh, if they went down a certain path first, it's going to make it a lot easier to go down a new path after. And what I mean by that is they would probably put you in a loan product for the first property, which um, is not going to create a flow and effect for the second property. And so this is why we often say property is a game of finance because your financial team, your advisors, your coaches, um, your uh, money people, they have to work out how to really fit a square peg into a round hole. And they can actually do it, but they just need to know your plan. And so it really does come back to your plan. And a lot of property investors kind of withhold information to brokers about the big picture. And so the broker's working off basically a limited amount of information, which is which gets a loan, but that loan actually goes on to impact the ability to borrow more because it was never even part of the dialogue to uh, have a um, second property. And then what needs to happen is things like refinance has got to start the loan again and it becomes this, oh, now I'm going to sit out of the market for a year while I have to go through refinances. So again, selecting the right loan product is an important part of the puzzle. And if that means you have to choose a certain loan on the day and then refinance, you just need to know there is a plan and you've got to go off and do it because plans ultimately require effort to actually come to fruition. So uh, make sure you know what you're going to do. And um, if you've got a bit of an idea, your team, which is also a big part of serviceability, will help you. And if I was to say what is, you know, the big, big, big thing that helps people service, it's absolutely your team. Again, you're not going to get a higher range of serviceability from using one bank. You're going to need a good uh, set of advisors, coaches, uh, mentors, uh, finance brokers. Uh, these people are the glue to the game. And again, if um, right, I was to say, what is the one thing that can increase your serviceability? And it's proximity. Proximity to those type of people um, that basically control money. Um, if you've got no proximity to those type of people, it's very unlikely that you're going to play the game of real estate well, which is really the game of money. And uh, serviceability is an important concept. Just be wary that income types are, are, are treated differently by nearly every lender. You know, PAYG is different to business income. Um, you know, distributions is considered different to income. Cash is considered different to distributions. Um, a second job is considered different. A um, uh, dividend is considered different again. And so um, we need, you can quite often have a high level of income um, but it's all considered differently. Now, a friend of mine has basically sold his business uh, for an incredible amount of money, something like uh, 20 odd million dollars. And the interesting thing is he gets, you know, a good level of interest, which he lives off from the, obviously just a bank rate level of interest. And he wanted to use the uh, bank rate level of interest, which is, you know, a lot of money, like half a million dollars or something, to, you know, use that to service and borrow money. And the bank said, no, like, you don't have a job. 
even though you've got income, that income can't be used to assess a loan. And so all income is, sep- is, is, is different. And uh, it doesn't mean not having that income is useful. It's just be aware that income types are treated differently by nearly every lender. And so again, like if you were just pop down to your local bank, you know, they may see one version of income one way uh, and another bank will see it another way. And so this is why uh, a knowledgeable broker is very, very important. Um, personally, I, I've got like so many sources of income that, you know, go into my money bucket from sort of dividends, from stocks to, um, you know, basically uh, business dividends to wage uh, intake to um, other sources of revenue that, again, you think, well, I'm doing okay, but the banks don't see it that way. And so this is where you've got to mirror up with the right lender and really shop around so that you um, can put yourself in the right position. The other thing you can do from a serviceability point of view is split some of your liabilities if you have a partner. Um, You can, you know, own properties in different names. You can, for example, put your family home in uh, one person's name. The only challenge with all that is you better make sure that you are going to go the distance as uh, as basically a couple. Um, You know, I've seen also that stuff unfold and get very nasty later um, when, uh, you know, people fool around and um, don't don't end up seeing out their marriage. Obviously, if you get married, uh, you sign an oath and that means you're married for life. So uh, if you can stick to your vows, you could absolutely increase your serviceability by splitting out some of your liabilities, um, even with uh, children and and uh, extended family. And uh, again, that can... Uh, get into a little bit more complicated structuring, which you probably need some more detailed advice around. But absolutely, um, you know, you can uh, you can uh, do something about that if you wanted to. And so, uh, really, the other way to get serviceability is kind of counterintuitive to what I talked about with cross securitization but actually if you do cross securitize um, you can often get a better rate of servicing and I know that's sort of counterintuitive and you've just got to be mindful that you if you cross securitize you really want low rates of debt um should something go wrong. So it's a little bit fiddly. I always say people should cross-securitize as they um, go into their consolidation phase. And uh, the consolidation phase may mean they actually change investment focus. And so what a lot of people do that I know, and I help a lot of people also do this, is they change the trajectory of their servicing to go to more uh, accelerated ways to create income. And so what happens is, let's say we built a property portfolio of five properties. We use different lenders to get there because we don't want to cross-securitize. All of a sudden, we're now in a position where we've got, you know, a couple of million dollars of uh opportunity that that is there we can't really borrow money to go buy another property uh but if we could service some of the equity in the asset we could do something with that as a deposit onto something so what a lot of people do is they end up uh basically crossing their properties with one lender getting a very very low rate extracting some equity out of the portfolio and using that equity not to go and buy another property, but they go into things like joint ventures and syndications where they armchair develop, where they invest in basically investments as a sophisticated 
investor. And uh, other people do all the work and they basically are the investor. So again, like when you've got equity, there is a point where your equity is uh, basically not suitable for more investments where there's leverage. When your equity is suitable for investments where you just add some seed capital, then uh, you generally go into that sort of space. And of course, one of the other ways to get more serviceability is to look at your loan terms. Like, you know, a lot of people um, are young. uh, They've got 15 years to go on a loan. That was a 30-year loan. And, um, you know, they've done well, but they could do better. And one way they could do better, which sounds horrible, is restarting their loan to a 30-year loan, lowering the uh, basically repayments and um, unlocking serviceability. So good mortgage brokers obviously have the ability to, to help you with all of this stuff. And of course, I think one of the best ways to uh, unlock serviceability and to get more money out into the, into the property market is to just have a good combination of playing the financial system, the finance market, uh, making sure you know your equity position, looking after your financial uh, uh, basically risk profile and save some money and you can just get going again. Remember, there are ways to play the real estate market if you um, are running out of serviceability and you really do need to do what is often referred to as a finance health check. Basically, you will come out, come out of those meetings generally with the idea, okay, well, if I restructured my mortgage, if I restarted my loan term, if I saved more money, if I got rid of that credit card, um, if I uh, decided to open a new structure, if I use my dividends in a structure that allows me to borrow money with this certain bank, or maybe it's like, okay, um, maybe it's time to look at another entity, um, These type of conversations are the conversations property investors have. And so hopefully that kind of highlighted what's possible. Um, And again, like today's episode, you know, probably comes with a, just a, uh, a a red flag that you should definitely go and speak to people um, in more detail because this is the devil's in the detail with this stuff. So uh, please reach out to your uh, team and uh, they may be able to point you in the right direction. But hopefully it sparked a bit of interest because again, real estate's a game of leverage and unless you don't, unless you uh, don't, how am I going to say this? Wow, what a bad ending to the show. Now I'm tongue tied. Uh, Look, real estate's a game of leverage. You've got to leverage to be wealthy. Um, It's the only way to do it. You're not going to save yourself wealthy. That's a fact. All right, folks, that's it for me. I'll catch you on the next episode where we talk more real estate. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.